Thomas Felder, and I'm here this morning with you on our Transformation Bible Study. And we're on Revelation chapter 5, Revelation chapter 5. If you're online and you're seeing this now, it's because there was some spiritual technical warfare going on with the computer and the internet this morning, but we're going to praise Elohim anyhow and move forward with the Bible study. You will probably be watching it just a little bit later uh, than when we do it. I'll upload it as soon as we're done doing it live on the telephone today. Um, let's pray. Dear Father, be with us for the next few moments as we go through your holy word today, and we pray that someone will get a blessing from it. Uh, in your holy son, Yahshua's name, I mean, I mean, and I mean again. So let it be, so let it be, so let it be. Everybody, we are in Revelation chapter 5 this morning. Revelation chapter 5. Let's jump right in. Revelation 5 verse 1. And it says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals, I just want you to know that when a wax seal was applied to a document, it was to make sure that it was secure and authenticated. It was an important document. Normally a document sent by a counselor or a king or a high representative. Now let's break down this verse one of Revelation chapter five. It says, and I saw, we have started a brand new chapter in the Bible, but not a new vision. This is still the vision that John is having from Revelation chapter four. And John continues on from the previous chapter and are thus still in the throne room of God. He is now going to give an account of what he saw. He says, in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, the right hand denotes power and authority. In Psalms 20 verse six, in Psalms uh, 18 verse 35, the right hand denotes power and authority. And from the following verses, we see that it is that it is Christ that comes to the Father who is seated on the throne, right? We see that on verses six and seven. Uh, the Father is seated on the throne. So it is the Father that has this book in his right hand and holding it with his power and authority. No man no being in heaven or earth is strong enough to take this book out of God's hands. Nobody. The Bible says that a book was written within and on the backside. Now, that's not like books that we have today. In John's day, they used long scrolls of parchment, and they were written on one side and then rolled up around a long stick with the writing on the inside. The books were... Um, the books were bound one edge, the books were not bound uh, on one edge, like on a binder or a seam until like the second century BC, right? So it was a long time before books looked similar to what you and I have. So the writing on the backside has something to do with the witness's signature, right? Because most of the scrolls only had writing on the inside, no writing on the outside. However, if it needed to be witnessed by a separate party, by a third party, you know, like when you get a document signed and, and then you need a, another person to sign off on it, like a will, maybe, like a will, you need another person to sign off on it. So this one needed an extra signature that is on the backside of it. And we'll talk about that in a second, because the Bible talks about a very specific type of, type of document that needed to be witnessed even after it was sealed. The Bible said it was sealed with seven seals. The number seven denotes completeness and thus shows that this book was perfectly sealed. Thus no person could open it unless they had the authority to break the seals. Yesterday I was talking to Miss Rita and we was talking about the book of Revelation, you know, seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven plagues, seven angels, se you know, seven horns, seven eyes, Every place we look in Revelation, we see a reminder of God's completion and perfect, perfect, perfection in everything that he does. Let's go to Revelation uh, chapter 5, verse 2. Revelation 5, verse 2. Read along with me this morning if you have your Bibles. And it says, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals? Who is worthy? Verse three, 
and no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Verse four, and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. When we get to verse two, a strong angel is proclaiming. You know, all of the angels, they ain't no chump angels. <laughs> ain't no man be pammy, sissy angels. But the Bible said a strong angel proclaims who is worthy. This strong angel comes out like a crier or a herald, somebody making an announcement in the middle of the city square. And he's got to use a loud voice. Reason being, they are in God's throne room. And as we have read in Revelation 4, there are 10,000 times 10,000 angels in the throne room. That's 100 million angels in the throne room. And then the Bible says thousands of thousands. So we don't know. You know, once you do 10,000 times uh, 10,000 and then put thousands times 1,000 in your calculator, it gives you an error message. So we don't even know how many angels are in there now. So this angel's got to speak up over everybody else in there. And he's crying out, is there somebody here of moral worth? Of all the creatures in the universe, is there somebody able to open this book by loosening the seals? And then the Bible comes back and says, no man. The angel says, no man. The Greek word oudis means not one including not only men, but all the beings throughout the universe. There was no angel who was worthy. No other person or any other world or universe that was worthy. After the challenge has been sent forth, there is found no person, whether in heaven or on earth, that is able to open this book. And it appears to John that the book is going to remain sealed, as we see from the reaction that follows. He says, in heaven, in heaven, in Revelation um, Five, three. These words introduce a literary device employed to describe all of God's universe. So when he starts to say in heaven going forward, he's talking about God's universe. To look thereon. So there was nobody able to read it or even look at its content, contents. So it wasn't like they were able to read the scroll and not figure out what it said. They couldn't break the seals. They don't know what's on the inside. So John says in verse four, I wept much. These words reflect John's intense emotional reaction to the drama now passing before his eyes. What he saw and heard was very real to him. The revelation was not written without tears, neither without tears will it be understood. If you wanna understand this word, you're gonna be fasting and praying and crying and reading and studying. You're gonna spend some time, there's some work and what is our reaction to things in God's word that we struggle to find an answer to? You ever struggle or wrestle with your Bible? Or I struggle and wrestle with mine. Boy, let me tell you, this thing looks like it's been through war, war three. I wrestle with this thing. I underline in it. I mark in it. I got concordances and dictionaries and all types of things. I want to understand what's in this word, man. Let's go to verse five, Revelation 5, 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, have prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Now, Christ is called the lion of the tribe of Judah, representing his victory and kingly strength. But he also appears as a sacrificial lamb that we'll come to in verse 6. But this mighty lion conquered sin in our behalf by humbling himself to become a lamb that was slain for our sins, according to Romans 8, verse 3, and Philippians 2, 5 through 8. This is why he alone is worthy to open the seals. To those who seek his mercy with repentance and confession, he is still the lamb who takes away our sin. To those who persistently refuse him, he will one day appear as a lion. Let me give you an example. Any of y'all got a dog, like a big vicious dog, like a pit bull or one of those kind of dogs, right? One, one of the dogs that the kids can play with and he's okay and the kids jump on his back and pull him by the ears. But if a stranger comes through the door, he's going to take their kneecap off. 
That's the difference that we see here. He's a lion to those who come against his people, but he's a lamb when he's with his people. Are you with me? He shows love and tenderness and care and affection. Let's go to Revelation 5, verse 6. Revelation 5, 6. And it says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elder stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now, in, 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 this, um, in this text, it says, in the midst. So this lamb shows up in the middle of the living creatures and the throne and among the elders. Now, he didn't just pop up. He was always there, this lamb. This lamb was always there. But now the Bible is suggesting that the intention is put on the lamb. The spotlight is now on the lamb. The word that is used for lamb here is significant. The word is arneon, arneon. Now this word is used 29 times in Revelation and only once elsewhere in the New Testament. The only other place it's used in the New Testament is in John 21 verse 15, where Christ told Peter, feed my lambs. The term is used in connection with the Passover lamb that was to be taken from home, taken like taken home by the children and cared for for four days before it was sacrificed. Why would he let these, the kids play with what was gonna be sacrificed four days later? Why would he let them do that? The reason he did that is he wanted the entire family to have feelings for this, this lamb. It was supposed to be like a pet. They were gonna feed the lamb from their very table, you know? Mary had a little lamb. His fleece was white as snow. Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. This lamb was like part of the family. And so when they slew the lamb four days later during the Passover, it was not to be slain without feeling or attachment. We are not supposed to be able to read the Bible and read about the sacrifice that Yahshua did for us on the cross and just be okay. Just go to sleep. Just another day. Just turn on the game afterward. No, man. No. John has heard Christ called a lion and a conqueror, but as he looks, he sees a lamb. Such a dramatic contrast may suggest that Christ's victory is not one of physical force, but of moral excellence. For above all things else, he is declared to be worthy. Now this lamb has seven horns. Most lambs only have no horns and some lambs, which they call rams, the male lamb or sheep, sometimes have two horns. There's even a set of sheep out there that have four horns. But this lamb has seven horns. So we know there's not literal horns, it's symbolic of the power, right? If you go to Deuteronomy 33 17, it suggests that horns symbolize power. And the number of seven is that of perfection or completeness. So here's a symbol of Christ's complete or fullness of power. You want to understand his power? It's in laying down his life, like the lamb. His power is also in his omnipotence. Before Christ ascended back to heaven, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, Matthew 28, 18. So by dying and being slain, he got all the power. The Bible says seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. So this, this lamb has seven eyes. Eyes are a symbol of intelligence and perfect wisdom. Thus, they are coupled together with the number seven. Number seven, It would show Christ's complete or perfect wisdom, all-knowing. He is omniscient. Nothing is hidden from his eyes, according to 2 Chronicles 16, 9, which says the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the entire earth. Right? Nobody misses his eyes. He sees who snatched that little girl yesterday. He sees who robbed the bank, who cheated on their taxes, who's tipping around on the internet. He, he even sees what you're dreaming about. Nothing misses him. In Revelation 5, 7, it says, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Now we already know it's God, the Father. Elohim was sitting on the throne and his son is coming to take the book out of his right hand. 
what is this book? What is this unusual book that is written on both sides? No other scrolls are written on the inside and outside except for one type of scroll that we find in the book of Jeremiah. In the book of Jeremiah. In the book of Jeremiah, it talks about a redemption, a redemption of, of property, a redemption of property. So this book talks about redeeming or buying back the inheritances in the land of Israel. And we find the, the sequence of a book of redemption in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, verses 23 to 28. So if a person had their, sold their land and because of poverty, they were unable to redeem it or buy it back, somebody in their family, a kinsman, someone who's related to them, if they had enough money, can step in and buy back the land on their behalf, redeem the land on their behalf, right? We find that in Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 6 to 14. In Jeremiah, he was asked to buy the parcel of land as it was his right to redeem it. They recorded the transaction. And there were two books one book that was written and left open, the other was an exact copy, but rolled up and sealed. These contain the title deeds to the redeemed inheritance. And if you look at on my screen, I think I put Jeremiah 36, but I'm, I believe it's Jeremiah 32. So if I got it wrong, check Jeremiah 32. So in a commentary written about the judicial law of Moses by a man named Weems, he talks about the manner of the contract evidence in Jeremiah uh, chapter 32. And it goes like this. He says, for the manner of the writing of the contract, he who was to buy the ground wrote two instruments or documents, the one to be sealed with his own signet, meaning his own signature, and the other he showed unclosed, right? So it was signed by himself and sealed with his own seal, like with wax and then whatever his symbol is. The other he showed unclosed to the witnesses that they might subscribe and bear witness of that which was written. This the witness did subscribe upon the back of the, un, of the enclosed or sealed instrument. So once it was rolled up and sealed, the witness who saw what was on the inside before it was sealed had to sign his name. So from this, we can see that the scroll contained in the title deeds to the lost inheritance was written within, rolled up, sealed, and written on the backside. The book is the title deeds to the lost inheritance through man's rebellion. Let me ask you something. Did man own a piece of property on earth and they lost it? Who, who owned the land during creation? God gave it to Adam. And this world was supposed to be Adam's and Adam was going to be the king of this world. But Adam and Eve through sin lost the world and it was given to Satan. And here we have Christ saying, I'm coming back to get what's mine. I'm redeeming the land that's mine. And he did that by dying on the cross. If that don't bring a tear to your eye, that he was willing to die to get back the land, because there was nothing that we could do to buy it back. Nothing. Let's go to verse eight, Revelation 5, eight. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and 20 elders, the 24 elders we talked about in Revelation four, fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors. That's, those are the prayers of the saints. Remember those the Bible says that when we pray, it is like perfume in his nostrils. And the Bible says, which are the prayers of the saints, verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereon. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So these are people who are representative of all of the saved. And they're gonna come out of every country, every language, every people, every nation. Verse 10, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. I want you to imagine 
uh, your whole church singing a song together. Uh, your whole church is singing on cue together. What would that sound like? Now I want you to imagine your whole your whole town, now your city, now your whole state singing one song together in perfect harmony, all together. Now imagine all of heaven. 10,000 times 10,000, that's 100 million angels. You know, more people than, than, than 20 or 30 or 40 football fields full of, full of people singing the same song in perfect harmony at the top of their lungs. That's what's going on, man. Everybody's singing this song. They're singing the song. The Bible's going to give us the words to the song. Y'all better learn this song because we're going to sing it sooner or later. I'm getting my pipes ready. Uh, in Revelation 5, 8 through 10, Jesus has the right, or Yahshua has the right to open the seals because by his blood, he has redeemed his people and called them out of every nation. And he has called us to be kings and priests and to minister to others and to offer them the sacrifices of praise. When we praise him, that is a sacrifice. So never be ashamed to cry out and to sing out and to pray out, right? It is like, it is like music to his ears. Hebrews 13, 15 talks about the sacrifice of praise. Let's go to verse 11, uh, Revelation 5, 11. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. That's 100 million and thousands of thousands. Your calculator just broke. In response to the host of heaven, they join in to acclaim the worthiness of the Lamb. The song of praise swells out in space and time to the grand climax when every knee on earth and under the earth, that means even the powers of evil shall bow and confess that Jesus Christ, Yahshua HaMashiach, that Yahshua the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We find that in Philippians 2, 9 to 11, even Lucifer is going to sing out that he is Lord. Verse 12, it says, verse 12, Revelation 5, 12, it says, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. You want to know the words of the song that we're all going to be singing in unison? Well, hear the words. If you don't read this Bible, when you get there, you won't know the words, man. But if you read the Bible, you will forever remember it. And when you get there, He's going to bring it back to your remembrance, and you're going to sing this song. Can you imagine everybody you ever met singing this song in perfect harmony? Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings, and they sing it over and over and over and over. This is the doxology of heaven, and it is sevenfold. It is sevenfold power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. It is a sevenfold praise, signifying that the praise of heaven is complete and perfect. Power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor, glory and blessing. It is a sevenfold praise. Man, you want to talk about praise? Sevenfold. This is the attitude of heaven towards the Son of God and his work since the cross of Calvary, an attitude that rises to a crescendo as the great controversy comes to a victorious close. The great controversy is the, the fight between good and evil. It's coming to a close. And as we go through the book of Revelation, we'll watch it end. We will watch it end. We'll watch this great controversy between good and evil come to a close. Verse 13. Revelation 5.13, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, as such as are in the sea and all that, that are in them, heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. This is John. He's hearing these people, man. He's hearing the song. I mean, this is some serious praise going on. And the four beasts said, amen, so let it be. They signified, they agreed with what was going on. And the four and 20 elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. You talk about reverence, man. 
talk about reverence, you think about praying, hit the ground, man. Hit the ground, lay prostrate, show reverence, recognize whose presence you're coming into. When we pray, we enter into his presence. We bring him into our presence. Moses, when he got into the presence, when he was just in the bush that was on fire, the bush said, take your shoes off, man. I know I look like a stump. I know that there's rocks on the ground. I know there's dust and dirt. But when I came into the place, the tree became holy and the ground became holy. Even the dirt is holy when he steps in. This is good stuff, man. I'm excited. Hopefully you're excited too. We're done with Revelation chapter 5. I'll stay on. We'll, we'll do some Q&A today on the, the phone as usual. Um, for those of you who are joining us online, I do appreciate you. Sorry for the technical problems we ran into today. Um, it's one of those things, one of those things. We're praying that tomorrow the Father will allow us to get on on time with no issues and no problems. But listen, had we gone all of this time with no interference from the devil, we would have thought that we were having no impact. We would have thought we were having no impact. I look forward to seeing each of you at the gates of the kingdom for what would it profit us to gain the whole world and to lose our own soul. Until I meet you and greet you, walk with the king today and be a blessing. Today's Bible study online is officially over. Elohim bless.